What's good? It's your guy, Hello Ego, here talking today a little bit about the Fab Filter Volcano. So, I wanted to make a complete deep dive tutorial on this for a little while now because this is one of those synths that I had since filters, you know, one of those filters that I've had for a long time and maybe only in the past like year have I gained a complete appreciation for it. Uh, it's just sounds so good and it's just so powerful and it can do a bunch of really, really, really interesting, crazy things. So let's just dive into it. First of all, open up Volcano 3. Um, you're probably presented with something along the lines of that, right? Which is, I don't know, for me, for some reason that just shows up. You can just click vintage or click default setting or something like that. So I'll click default setting and you're presented with a completely flat, no filter type sound. Uh, let me go ahead and get a drum loop in here. Um, here, I, I made some glitch loops for my Patreon. Hello, Ego. Glitch. Ha, oh, that's weird. So let's just use these weird little glitch loops things and we'll make this sort of like um, some of the material that we filter. That's pretty dope. All right, so we are going to, first of all, add a filter to this. Double click to create a filter. Um, the default setting is a bell. So I'm just gonna dive through what each of these are here. The bell curve uh, allows you to cut or boost a small region uh, around the frequency here. So if I wanted to maybe cut some of that sharpness in the top end, I can get rid of it like that. And I can actually widen, like in any other EQ, can change the slope of this here. So a sharper slope by turning this up. So basically what this means is it'll be 48 decibels per octave slope. Means that uh, over the course of 48 decibels, we are going to decrease, or over the course of one octave, we will increase or decrease the amount of volume um, by 48 decibels. So compared to six decibels, which is a much more gentle slope. Now what that means is that over the course of one octave, you're only going to increase or decrease the frequency by six decibels. So significantly less, right? What is that, eight times less? Six, 12, 24, yeah. So I think it's like eight times more intense of a filter. You can think of it like that, if that's helpful for you. All right, so let's take out some of these highs. Nice, getting rid of some of that stuff there. There we go. All right, so this is the bell curve. This is just one of the different types of filters. Uh, we also have low pass, which is a filter that will cut all of the highs, AKA low pass. We can cut some of those highs out like that. We have the high pass, which is the opposite of a low pass, allowing only the highs through. Right? And by dragging this left and right, I can change which frequency I'm filtering at. You can see the frequency listed right here. You can also see this knob moving. This knob is another way to change the frequency. And if you're curious as to what note you are currently filtering at, that shows you down here too. Like, let's say you want to cut uh, an exact frequency, right? Maybe everything that is like above uh, or everything that's below, perhaps maybe C, what is that? C F4, let's go down to C4, which is right here. There we go. We can go ahead and shift this down to C4 by dragging this right here. And this will allow you to filter a certain, a certain specific note, which is pretty cool if you want to add a resonance peak at a very particular note, right? We'll get into that a little bit later too. But you can change the frequency. I mean, this is just the hertz. This is the actual note, very useful. You can turn this on or off, right? If I like to have, keep it turned on, doesn't really make much of a difference to me. Next, we have the bandpass filter. So the bandpass filter is only going to allow uh, everything above this edge and below this edge of the filter, right? A narrow band of frequencies come through.
by increasing the uh, by dragging upwards here what you're doing is you're increasing the peak or the and other filters this is also called the resonance the resonance is a volume boost that is uh, occurs at the point at which the uh, cutoff is set so If I want to increase this area, I can pull this up or I can pull this down. Next we have the bell curve, which is the first one we started with, right? The bell curve is the default setting. This just allows you to boost or cut a very specific region. Like this tutorial, like these lessons, want more like them, want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I have a website, ableton.privatelessons.com. You can go ahead and book a session directly with me through that. Also got a Patreon where I upload uh, very in-depth tutorials like this, as well as sample packs every month. All right, that's all I gotta say. Back to the tutorial. Next, we have the low shelf. Now the low shelf is going to boost or cut everything below the current uh, frequency setting. So you can see how I'm kind of cutting everything below 500 and approximately 50 hertz right there. Alternately, you can also have a high shelf, and that's going to boost or cut everything above uh, above the cutoff. These are some nasty sounds. If you want these sounds, they're in my Patreon in January, which is this month, so I should release that like today. Um, but yeah, anyway, so this is the uh, high shelf. Then we have a notch, and what a notch will do is just cut everything entirely. It's like a complete cut of a certain frequency range. And kind of cut all the lows out of it like that. Uh, pulling this up or down will increase or decrease the range that you're cutting. Next, we have the all pass. Now, this is a really cool filter. An all pass filter, uh, like the name suggests, passes all the frequencies, but what it does is it, it introduces phase shifts, which can get some really cool sounds. I'm not really noticing anything right here. Let's turn the peak up, maybe. Peak down, uh, drive up. No, I mean, I'll get into all these things in a second. Uh, what is it? There we go. We can try and make a more aggressive slope. You can tell some shifts are happening. So yeah, you can hear it shifting the sound a little bit, but that's all it's doing. It's just creating phase shifts, which will cancel and create phase cancellation, right? Or add and create phase additions. Very interesting kind of filter. I'm glad they have this in here. Let's just go back to the standard bell curve, pull this down so we don't create any piercing tones. And now that I've gone through this, I just kind of want to go through this whole section down here. So you kind of understand how this works at this point. Oh. Let me get rid of that. Uh, here's another thing too, actually. You see what I did right there was I clicked elsewhere and I created another, uh, another e, what do you call it, filter uh, point. I created yet uh, another filter. You can have up to four filters in here. Let's say you accidentally add one and you don't want, you want to get rid of it. You can just come up here and click X like I did and that will get rid of the extra filter for you. We'll dive, we'll dive into more filters later. For now, I just want to stick with a single filter while I explain all of this. Uh, if you want to simply turn a filter on or off without actually deleting it, you can turn this on or off here, or you can hover over it and do the same thing here. This is the same control. Um, here's where you can actually like pan through which of the pan through, I guess like scroll through which of the filters you're on. So if, if I want to work with filter two, I can, you know, set this to two. If I want to work with filter one, it'll switch back and forth between them like that. Here we have the drive. Now, drive will increase the gain of the incoming signal before the filter. It's not a distortion effect after the filter. It is a drive before the filter. And there's a bunch of different filter modes, which I'll dive into here. And the drive interacts differently for each of them. Let's just turn the drive up here so you can see what it's doing. Yeah. 
Hear that distortion it adds there? Yeah, so it's a really nice drive effect and it uh, acts differently for each of these. We'll get out of that in a minute here. Uh, you might notice a couple times what, what I'm doing is I am double clicking it and typing it in. Uh, instead of just moving the knob, if you wanna go back to zero or whatever, the best way to do it, double click, hit zero, and you can go ahead and set any control to exactly where you want it. As I mentioned before, we have the uh, filter frequency knob right here. And then outside of that, we have another ring, which is the filter pan. You can actually pan a filter off to one side or the other. You see how I'm creating this like really cool little split in the filter like that? And it's panning one over in the other way. And you can also invert it too. So we've got the left side and the right side. Get some pretty neat stereo effects that way. That's already at zero, so that's good. All right, let's go ahead and dive into the different uh, types of filters. So we have classic mode. And you can hear the, the effect of the distortion has is much different here than the other one. Here, what were we on before? We were on gentle. These things are often much more noticeable with higher higher resonance because it's really modeling it after like analog resonant type different ways, you know? So, oh look, it says they are particularly different here. If you hover over it and look at what it says, the very bottom tip, try to load the clean preset and try every filter style to get it. They are particularly different with higher peak values. See, like, like I just said, when you turn the peak up, they sound a lot more different. Um, a lot more different? They sound more different. Yeah, that's right, that was right. Let's go to smooth. That's nice. Ooh, very different. Extreme distortion ahead of it. A nice warm tube. I like this one a lot. I really like raw and tube a lot. Metal's crazy as well. Ooh, that's a lovely area. It gets a little sharp points, but... Oh man, so good. Anyway, uh, explore these on your own, right? Like I always just flip through a whole bunch of them and find which ones I like. So check this out. We now have a delay right here. And what this does is it will delay the signal going through a filter, all right? Now, if I just turn this up, it's not gonna do too much. And actually, you know what I should do is find like a pad All right, here, we'll just use this pad for right now because this is an easier demonstration. Now, check it out. I can actually use this to create almost a bit of like a lo-fi type of tape warble effect by just moving this around very gently. Pretty cool. Let's just try and find like a clean something. Yeah, this is pretty clean. Now, another really neat thing you can do with this is you can actually set uh, one filter to have a delay and have another identical filter next to it. All right. Now, currently, when I have them set like this, they add together. Do you see how these come up and add like that? I don't want that to happen. What I actually want the routing to do is to come down here and set this from serial mode into parallel mode. And now I can overlay them on top of each other without creating an addition because what's happening here with the routing, and I'll dive into more of these later because when you add more filters, you get more routing options. But you can see this line here is basically the audio path. The audio goes in in serial, or serial mode. It goes in to filter one, gets filtered by filter one, goes into filter two, filtered by filter two. But if you go in parallel mode, the audio gets split into filter one and filter two, and they get processed separately and then mixed back together on the other end. So if you're on filter one, you can add a delay to it, and then you can have filter two, so have the no delay, that's gonna create a bit of a uh, stereo width situation going on. Maybe I'll find something that's a little easier to check out with this, perhaps like a 
I'll just search mono. Here we go, like a mono bass sound. Let me delay one of these filters a little bit. And I actually want to pan these left and right. So that'll make it, so if I go over here to the output pan, I'll pan filter um, two output to the left and filter one output to the right. And now if these are on the exact same setting, which they are pretty much, let's actually make it exact, exact. Let's just go 600 for this one and 600 for this one. So technically without the delay, not even technically, just without the delay, there's gonna be no stereo addition. I'm driving one. Let's put this to zero too. I'm gonna make them exact. Gentle and classic. We'll just go to gentle for both of them. There we go. All right, now it's right down the middle. But if I delay one of them, you're essentially introducing a little bit of the Haas effect. And you get this awesome stereo effect going on. So you can use that delay to create weird stereo things going on like that. Uh, you may have noticed I came over here and changed the output pan, right? You can actually just change the output level of an individual filter or change the output pan of the individual filter as well and move one left and one right all the way over like that. So let's just go ahead and set these back to zero on both of them. I'm actually gonna get rid of filter two. I don't want it anymore. So another way you can do this stereo thing here is you can actually come over to the routing and set these to be uh, left and right right there. So I'll set the pan back to zero for both of these filters. Zero like that and like that. Now I'm gonna, right now it's set to stereo mode. And what this means is basically each of these filters is processing the full stereo signal. I can set this to left or right per channel. And now what we've got is a situation where the left channel is being, being processed by filter one, the right is being processed by filter two. And now if I add a delay, we get the same kind of thing going on. We get that stereo width. And to be honest, it sounds a little different. It sounds a little better in my opinion because really it's just taking just the left channel as opposed to taking the full signal and then panning it to the left. It's a different way of going about it. You can do either and either way is fine. It depends on the kind of sound you want and the kind of sound you're getting out of it. So in this situation, I'm getting like a cleaner stereo width on this bass. Pretty cool, I like that a lot. Um, you also have mid side mode where you can assign one to uh, boost the mid channel and one to boost the side channel. Uh, let me go ahead and use this um, undo button to switch that around. Now the issue here is that this is a mono bass sound. There's actually no stereo width to it at all. So in order for me to demo this, I have to add a little stereo width. Uh, I'm gonna use a chorus to do this. And just add a chorus to it. Turn the amount up high because I'm trying to make a point here. Let's do dry wet, there you go. So what I can do with this side band is I can turn the uh, mount down like that and now I can boost just the side, the stereo content in certain frequency ranges. Or I can boost just the mids, like maybe I want to boost a little bit of the bass, the sub on this uh, in the mid content. Great for stereo processing. I think I wanna go back to this glitch and play around with it a little too, because I believe this does have stereo content to begin with. Definitely does. So yeah, you can see how this can be very powerful. Let's just go back to stereo mode and I'm gonna get rid of filter two, so we're back to filter one. And I'm gonna now actually talk about the routing. So I don't know why I got rid of the, uh, the other filter because I wanna add another one in. Here we go. 
One, two, three, four. Let's add all four of them in. Now all four of these filters can operate separately from each other. They can all have different settings, right? So I'm going to set this one to raw. This one's going to be on, uh, well, gentle, because I accidentally clicked that. This one will be on classic. This one will be on whatever, metal. So they can all be different, all have different timbres, all have different panning, all over the place like that. And now with the routing, you can see we have a whole bunch of different options here. On this one, the uh, filter is entirely serial. So process by one, then process by two, then three, then four. So in this situation, if you're finding yourself like, oh man, I'm not getting any sound in this setting, like these aren't doing anything for me really. That's probably because you're cutting all the sound first. So those aren't going to do anything for you because first of all, it's going into filter one, it's being processed by that, and it's cutting all the sound off in filter one. Uh, you need to actually have this one be higher than the rest, or at least up closer to the rest of them in order for these to have an effect on it. The next one is serial. All of them are processed independently, each filter, uh, the audio gets split off and gets processed all, all together, uh, or all independently, and then gets mixed back together again. Uh, next, we have a few other ones too. I mean, you can kind of tell what's going on, right? So this one, they're getting processed independently uh, from the one and two are, are in serial, and three and four are in serial, but one and two and three and four are separate from each other. And then here, you got a feedback loop going where one is processed being one, is feeding into uh, channel four, but it's going through two as well. So there's a bit of like cross feed going on that way. And yeah, just check out the diagrams and you know see what works best for you. You can do some really crazy sound design stuff with that. Same deal with uh, left and right per side. It'll just split them up in different ways like that. So you can process the left with one and two, process the right with two and four. All kinds of really, really interesting effects we made with this. All right, that I think covers everything in this little section. So now I want to get into the modulation portion of this because this is one of the more confusing aspects of Volcano. And it's one of the reasons I didn't use it for a long time. I love this uh, now, but now that I actually get what's going on with the modulation, but I think it requires a little explanation. So first of all, I'm gonna start with the XLFO, all right? The XLFO is like an LFO, but it is uh, a little weird. And this is what's so strange about this. Uh, let's go ahead and first of all, let me find the actual tempo, because I wanna do some tempo synced stuff. What is the tempo of this sample? Oh, it's 140. All right, so we'll just use 140 here. I do a lot, 140. All right, you've added my XLFO down here, and now I'm gonna click it to display this panel down here. First things first, how do I assign this to a, uh, to a filter? Well, pan over to the filter you want here. I keep saying pan, but I really mean scroll or click or whatever you wanna call it. So get over to the filter you want to control. In this case, I want to control filter one to get some like little wubby wubs in there. And this dot right here that's kind of blinking, showing the tempo of the LFO that's currently happening, the rate of it, you can click and drag it. And anything that you want to drag it onto is now highlighted. So let's go to one. You can see I can just hover over four, hover over two, and it brings me to that. So hover over one. I want to assign it to the frequency. And now... This frequency is one, yeah, there we go. Let's set the routing to serial. Now what we've got here is a little pop-up that can show you how much of this LFO you want to apply to the frequency. I could turn it up and we get a really intense um, filter cutoff. Right? Uh, you can also do just a little bit of it which is not that noticeable in this sound, but you can tell a little bit's happening. Well, let's keep it up pretty high so we can see what's up. We also have the polarity. So instead of the filter starting here and going up, then down, then ending here, instead it's gonna start here and go down, then up, and then end here. I'll show you what I mean. If I click this, you can see it flips around backwards. All right. So uh, it's, it's harder to tell when there's not other things going on, but that's what it'll do. Basically inverts. So instead of it going, you know, up and down, it goes down, then up, more or less. More or less. Not exactly, but. All right. I would like this to be tempo synced. Um, and I, where I do that is right here where it says free. 
So I can set this to perhaps maybe eighth notes. So now it'll move at eighth notes based on 140. Or I can set this to quarter notes. Yeah, there we go. Turn the drive up a little bit. That's pretty cool. Um, you can also just set it back to free if you want. And then free is going to operate on hertz rather than actual tempo sync. So let's keep this on that. Now, if you look around the edge here, these are starting points. Basically, they're offsets, all right? Uh, now, if you are, like, let's just say, if you put in the middle, this offset will um, have it start right in the location you have the filter set. But if you set the offset maybe over, you can click the little dot, and it will go directly over to, uh, what is this one again? One second. The frequency office at 1.33. So what is that, like a dotted note? Yeah, and this, this is dotted, this is triplet. So you can have it move in triplets, right? Let me turn this tempo on. That's a, that's a triplet right there. And this is dotted. And this is just inverse. Uh, so it's a slower dotted, and this is a slower triplet. Right, you can hear as it goes, one, two, three, over there, one, two, three, four. Um, so that's the way you can kind of count that out there. All right, so here we have the balance. Um, this is where you get into changing the shape of the waveform, all right? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this to a slower, um, a slower rate so we can see it more easily. If I turn this over here, then you notice it just kind of creates a down ramp, all right? This is morphing this sine wave into more of a saw wave. You can see it goes up really fast, and then down, and up, and down, and up, and down. And if I flip it the other way, it's gonna be an upwards ramp and then snap back down to the bottom and ramp upwards like that. So that's how you kind of transform this. You can actually do it in uh, smaller amounts, right? So this is like a soft ramp where it's ramping up, but it's going down more slowly. So it's not like an exact ramp, but this is just how you transform the shape of this from a sine wave over to something else. So let's put this back to zero now. Uh, double click, 0.5, which is the middle setting for it. Now over here we have the glide parameter. Now currently the glide is turned all the way up, which is giving us this kind of like softish wave, soft, you know, I guess a sine wave you can call it. This is a soft sine wave. You might be sitting here thinking, okay, well, I can create a square, I can create a saw wave by changing the um, the balance of it. How do I create a square wave? Well, by dragging this glide down. And now if you put it right in the middle, you've got a square wave where it'll snap up and down. Put the rate up higher. There you are. There's your square wave. You can also uh, turn this all the way down, which is really not doing anything right now, but I'll show you later and it'll it'll make sense later. But for right now, we've got this nice hard, let's do like a soft, soft saw or square. It's not quite as much of a click. You don't hear that pop in there, right? All right, let's set this back up to a sine wave. And I'm now gonna talk about this little section over here, which is sort of, kind of, you can think of it like a sequencer or something. Uh, another thing too, I'm gonna go ahead and adjust how much this is uh, affecting this. I can just click this little dot right here and turn it down like that. Uh, maybe a little more. I wanna be more visible, but not too crazy. Like that, there we go. Open this back up again. All right, so these are the steps we have, all right? So step one is all the way at the bottom. Step two is all the way at the top. This is zero, as you see right there. This is positive one and this is negative one. So let's, and you notice what's happening here is that this LFO is causing it to go above and below the central point of this uh, filter. Now, if I set this up to zero, now it's only gonna go in the positive direction from the point where my frequency is set. And if I set this one down to zero, now it's only gonna go in the negative direction uh, from where my frequency is set. So this is basically how you can choose the polarity of it a little bit, or you can choose the range of it. You can also narrow it here too, like that. 
but it's honestly easier to do that using the method I did here where you change it a little bit like that. Uh, you can add more steps to this. Let's go ahead and add another step and you can choose what this step is. Um, you can have it set be random. You can have it be linear, right? It's gonna be a single line. You can have it be square, right? And the square is currently not gonna be a real square because like before, you know, like I was saying before, it is glide, it is, it is glided, it has been glid, I suppose. So we can turn this down, you can see it turns into a square. But if I, and if I bring this down here, it'll be a little more obvious. Square wave, right? But if I set this to square RT, square, square, uh, oops, no, come back, come back, there we go. Which square RT, that stands for, um, I'm not really sure. I don't know what square RT, square triangle, like a soft square or something. I really don't know. Let me add another step and see if that tells me anything about it. So we have square RT versus square. So this one is square RT, square, square RT. Huh, interesting. Um, Oh, I see what's happening. It looks like it is sort of curving, like a triangle, kind of like, ah, it's an inverse of it. So instead of it curving outwards to get to the next one, it'll curve inwards like that. So do you see how this one curves outward and this one's curving inward? That's what that is. All right, cool. We just learned something together. Nice. Square RT. And then we also have sine, your classic sine wave, which just looks like that. And now we more or less have what's going on here, um, some sine waves, right? So this looks like a sine up, sine down. You can change the value using this knob right here. And this is how you can get some pretty cool sequences going. Let's go ahead and turn the glide all the way off. and loop this a little bit. And I'm gonna create a little bit of a sequence with this right here. Let's turn the peak up too, so we get some, uh, oops, I'm on the wrong one. I need to turn the peak up for, ah, come here, zero. Turn the peak up for this one. Let's add a few more steps. And for these ones, I'll just go back up, down, like that. And I'm gonna turn a few of these to random mode. Now random will uh, allow this step to be anywhere in here. So this is a way to add a little bit of uncertainty throughout it. And this is a cool sequence because it's only seven steps. So it's not really looping the same way each time. It's going seven and then looping back around before the end of the, uh, you know, perceived phrase of the loop we got going on here. You can also set a glide on a per step basis rather than the glide for the entire thing, like that. The glide on a per step basis, uh, like for instance, this one, right? It goes like that and we'll kind of swoop up to the next one a little bit. You can do a little more glide on that one right here too. Come on, why won't you turn up? Oh my goodness, there we go, like that. I hate knobs, there we go. But it does look like the amount of glide uh, depends on whether you have any glide per set right here. So if I have the glide set to zero, right in the middle, this is what I said I was gonna talk about earlier, I can turn the glide all the way up or all the way down for these steps, like that. But I can invert the glide here too, which means that it will, if I have this turned all the way down to negative, this is really gonna have like very little to no effect on any of these steps right here because the glide is inverted more or less. Um, I can really have it all glide like that. So really keeping it in the middle and messing with the glide on a per step basis is probably the way to do it right there. Pretty cool. So you can create really awesome sequences like that. Now, let's say, for example, we want to create certain pitches. Now, this is where it can get pretty interesting. Uh, I'm going to get rid of a bunch of steps here. Boom. So it's like clicking the little minus button. 
And I'm going to turn this um, that I, I kind of clicked it earlier. This basically will let me set a step based on the note. So let's click this right here and we can find a value for it and it will lock it to certain notes of the keyboard like that. Same with this one here. We'll lock it to these notes in the keyboard, which looks like this one is locked to, that's a C right there. We'll do C like that right there. C, E, we'll add another one. Oh, sorry, you should be C, E, C, E, G right there. So now we have like a triad. Turn the peak way up so we get some resonance out of it. You can hear it self resonating there. If I turn the peak all the way up, And it's important to make a note here that the actual notes of what you put this here don't really matter. Um, because let's say I have this set at C, E flat, G, which is sort of what I do. I don't think it's actually an exact G, but it's close enough anyway. C, E flat, G sharp maybe. So if I have these all set to these notes, it's not actually starting on a C. It's starting at wherever I have this set. So if I have this set right here to a C, then it's now a C, E, G, but if I have it set to a B or an A, then it's A, C, E, right? So you can also turn this whole like audio um, self oscillation thing off down here at the bottom where it says um, auto mute self oscillation. So now if I turn this up, it's going to mute that. But if I turn it on, we get some self oscillation. We can use this as a very difficult to use sort of a synth, right? Um, and the high peak mode like that is going to have a different effect based on all of these different modes you got. So that's a really cool way to use this as a sequencer. All right. I believe that's basically it about the LFO. Um, oh, right. This little button here I haven't talked about. So what this button will do is it will set up uh, the LFO to either um, run freely. So it'll never reset when a note is hit or it will re-trigger whenever you press a note. So it will, you know, be cycling through. Let me get like a more normal sort of, more normal thing going on here. So there's my, you know, um, oscillator, not oscillator, my oscillating filter, which is really what it is, right? There's my little filter moving around right there. So this is not gonna have much of an effect right now because I am using audio rather than MIDI. And no matter what, it's always gonna start right here at the top, go down, go back up. See if I press play, you'll see it always start around the top here. Right there. Um, but if I was using MIDI, then I could use retrigger or legato. And that would uh, retrigger the envelope whenever a MIDI note was pressed. And if you have it set to legato, it will basically, uh, like, you know how in legato, when you're playing a note and you hold another note down, you kind of like glide up to it, but it's only playing one monophonic note. It's only gonna trigger the uh, LFO on that very first note press. You have to actually release the note and play another one, and then it will uh, re-trigger it again. Otherwise, it's gonna stay uh, in its current, you know, rate, current timing for the entirety of the time that you are holding down the notes and, you know, legatoing one note to the next, all right? Uh, you know what? I should probably demo this, actually, just to make it a little more obvious. Let's just go ahead and get an operator. There we go. Legato. All these to go like that. Give it something to filter so we want more of a saw wave. Drag this onto that channel. 
If I set this to off, you see how on each of these notes it's not re-triggering, but if I set this to re-trigger, then every time we have a note on an uh, event, it should be re-triggering. Ah, uh, there we go. See that? Um, but I think it's because the release time is turned up. I have no idea why it's just re-triggering it at the beginning like that. Let me try and duplicate this out and see if it changes it. What the freaking heck, man? What is going on? All right, moving back over to the other channel that we had going on here. And I'm going to talk about some of the other modulators because that's everything I got for the XLFO. The other modulators definitely aren't going to take nearly as much time. So we're going to go and put a slider in here. Not that. We'll put a slider. Slider is pretty much what it, it sounds like, right? You can go ahead and, oh, you know what? I want to undo all of that because there's something else I want to talk about with the LFO. And that is that you do not actually have to open the LFO up to change some of these settings. You can come in here and um, there we go. You can change the sync mode of it like that by holding, by basically what I'm doing is hitting command and dragging up or down. You can also change the glide just by scrolling over it. So if I turn the glide way up, oh, let me see, turn the, there we go. So I'm swiping left and right to turn the glide up. And I, I wanna turn this not to, there we go. Let's go ahead and switch this. Swiping down for the rate and the sync mode is currently set. There we go. Let's set the sync mode. I'm dragging up for the sync mode to set it to one half, dragging left and right to change the glide like that. And it's also switching a little bit of the um, sync, the sync mode over there, which is kind of annoying, which is why I usually open it up, right? But you can really mess around with it from here. You can also come down here and click a 12 step sequence. And this is basically like a presets down here. And if you want to add in like your own preset, you can come here and be like, oh man, like I like, I added that right there, added that right there, added that right there, here, 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 yeah, whatever. And you can come over here and say, save as, and it's going to save as a preset here in the XLFO for you. Um, and it, yeah, well, you can go ahead and use that in the future and pull up some interesting sequences of yourself. Yeah. That's pretty good. Cool. Okay, that's the last thing that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to show you with the LFO is basically like the the scrolling you can do outside of this. Um, it says hold command right to to change the sync mode, but really I'm just scrolling up and down on my trackpad here and it's changing it. Um, but you can also switch it between um, if you hold command, it looks like it's kind of switching between free or not free. Right, you scroll down far enough, it goes to free. You scroll up the other way um, while holding command and it switches to sync mode like that. It tells you what to do right there. And then you can just change the glide by swiping left and right. A little complicated to use with the trackpad, but it's kind of cool. New modulation will add a slider. Nothing much to say about the slider. I mean, there's a little bit, but um, right? Slider's gonna move where this is at. Oh, that's disgusting. I love it. Um, if you set the slider to zero to one, this will be like, okay, it's gonna go from zero up to one, right? That's a positive direction. Click this little thing and go negative one, zero to one. So this is right in the middle. This is basically a, a bipolar and the other one's unipolar, all right? Right there. Uh, we go ahead and, um, and that's pretty much it. Yep, like I said, pretty simple on the slider. Uh, X, Y controller, this is a lot of fun. You can assign the X to something, like the frequency, and the Y to something maybe like the peak, and then just move this around. 
you can also add another LFO in here. You can assign the LFO to the um, hover over. Well, you can only hover over this item, not drag a. And so, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 all right. So let's drag this over to that. Can I? There we go. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to add a modulator to a modulator like that. And now I've got this LFO that is changing the uh, um, the slider. And you can see what's happening here. It's just moving it around while changing the peak. And let's go ahead and crank that up. Adding some pretty crazy distortion in there. But yeah, you can also modulate modulators with modulators, which is awesome. Uh, another thing too, this goes from zero to one, positive um, or positive, negative, unipolar, bipolar, same deal as the other one. All right, so to demo the next modulation, I wanted to uh, bring an operator in here just to make it easier because the new um, for this envelope generator is easier to show with something uh, with a sound that I can manipulate a little more. I just dragged this Spectra ARP in. Shout out, Mr. Bill. Got the best ARPs. And this envelope generator uh, works a little weird. It's not like, it's not going to work exactly like a standard envelope generator where it's like note on triggers the envelope. Instead, you have this threshold parameter. So let me show you what to do with this. I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to, here's our attack or a delay, sorry, delay. And then our attack. And then our decay time. And then right here is our sustain. Here's our hold, which is after the sustain. And then here's our release, like a standard envelope going on here. Um, and what you can do is, let me pull the sustain all the way down and assign this to the frequency all the way up. Do you see how it gives me one little and then it kind of just like stops, it goes back to, you know, the center position or whatever the resting position is it's because we need to adjust this envelope right here this threshold i mean i should say we need to adjust the envelope's threshold to um interact with the incoming audio go ahead and drag the frequency down Turn that peak down. Oh, it's very, very resonant. I'm going to turn on the audio mute self oscillation. Ah, super cool. Really, really, really neat stuff going on with this because it's basically just like um, taking the input and triggering the envelope every time the threshold gets triggered in a certain way. So instead of normal input, we can actually set this to a few different other types of input as well. We got sidechain, right? Where we use an external sidechain signal to trigger the envelope. Uh, we also have MIDI. Now this is a little tricky with Ableton. The issue here is that, um, well, let me just show you. First of all, uh, I have this set up so that these little notes should be triggering the sidechain, should be triggering the uh, envelope, I should say. But nothing's happening. Why is nothing happening? Well, this is because Ableton is only providing MIDI to the first uh, device in this sequence. In this situation, that's the operator, all right? Uh, so in order to fix this, in order to get around it, I'm gonna group the operator up. I'm gonna throw an external instrument on this channel. This is basically just gonna pass MIDI over to the track that we're on, to instrument, and then Volcano. Now it should work. And it does, right? Next one is the envelope follower. 
So this one's pretty cool in that. Let me get rid of that. We don't need that anymore. Uh, this acts like a normal envelope follower where we can basically say um, detect the incoming audio and have the filter react based on that. You can see it working a little bit up there, but it's not really um, that useful because it's up there very high. So you can adjust that with the level. You can also adjust that over here with the attack time. Right, you can also have it detect just transient onset. Which is gonna give it a little more motion. Let's go back to regular envelope mode. Um, you can also have a normal input, right, the audio that's currently running through it, or you can do a sidechain input as well, whichever you want. Let's go back to transient. Um, you can see I've been moving around these attack and releases right here. This is just basically how I um, uh, change how the envelope follower reacts to the incoming audio. Next, uh, same as before, you can go ahead and save all these and yeah, mess around with the different presets. Next one we've got is a MIDI source. So uh, you can add different types of MIDI sources here. We got Aftertouch, we have keyboard tracking, which is pretty cool. So check this out, if I do keyboard tracking, it's gonna track the notes that are being input uh, and then it's going to adjust the frequency based on that. But here's the issue, once again, we need to have an external instrument sending MIDI over to Volcano. There's also a bunch of different ways that this uh, keyboard tracking can interact with um, like how the response, I said, I should say. Linear, we have exponential response. Where like, you know, the lower notes will be closer, the higher notes will be higher. I think they'll be a little more in tune. Logarithmic response, which is opposite. Um, we have SQR, which oh, I don't even know what each of these means. SQRT and sign. I have no idea what these last three are from being perfectly honest with you, so read the manual. I don't know. I usually just use linear and exponential. Those are the ones that tend to work best for me when I'm using keyboard tracking. Uh, we also have external controllers, uh, aftertouch, velocity, pitch bend, mod wheel, right? You can send all these different, uh, all these different MIDI messages to Volcano and you can have it uh, interact differently with uh, your MIDI controller, all right? That is basically it, except I wanted to go over some of the extra stuff down at the bottom here. So down here we have um, our MIDI learn button, right? You can actually just like click MIDI learn, touch a parameter, turn your knob on your controller. It will learn that parameter and you can now control with that parameter. High quality mode, turn that on or off. It's gonna use more CPU, obviously with the high quality mode. Look at my CPU meter up here. It's hovering around 1920. I turn on high quality, jumps to 27, 20 something, six, something like that. So it is a substantial increase in quality. Audio mute self oscillation, we talked about that already. Uh, right here we have, uh, what is this one again? I know I've used this before. Uh, oh, it's just a bypass. All right, so you can bypass it on or off like that. Um, here we have the overall mix, the overall input and output volumes, right? Input gain, output gain, input pan, output pan. Um, and then you can choose the size of the device. Okay, and I think that is everything. I think I've covered this entire VST as best I can currently right now. Hopefully you found that useful and yeah, uh, happy volcanoing. Like this tutorial? Like these lessons? Want more like them? Want to work with me one-on-one? -on -one? I have a website, ableton.privatelessons.com. You can go ahead and book a session directly with me through that. Also got a Patreon where I upload uh, very in-depth tutorials like this as well as sample packs every month.